All right, all right, all right. Well, welcome back to another episode of Good News for Those Who Struggle. Yeah, absolutely. We have a like fantastic on fire crowd. They won't there's they won't be silenced. I love it. They're at, they're rowdy today. These guys that are that are um, cheering us on, and I think it's because they know our guests today. Our, our guests. Speaking of rowdy. Let's go. <laughs> We've got some rowdy guests with us um, this afternoon, and uh, we're going to be talking to Sam Powers and Michaela Page, and uh, we're excited for them to uh, be able to introduce themselves, tell a little about themselves, share some of their journey. Uh, today's episode is going to be focused on mental health and our youth and kind of what's going on out there in the landscape of the youth. Um, what's what's a word um, to some of our youth and then um, a word to parents. So if you are a youth, if you influence the youth, if you are a parent, um, if you care about um, this upcoming generation um, or if you just like uh, would would like to have an idea of of kind of like what's happening out there and um, you know how we might be able to uh, intervene and have a relevant word there uh, this is going to be an episode for you so um, my name's Casey. I serve as one of the pastors at the AC, and I love getting to host this uh, podcast. And so we're going to go ahead and hop right in. And both Sam and Michaela um, work in leadership with our youth. Sam is um, the youth pastor of Kingdom Students, which is a combined uh, ministry effort between uh, Trinity uh, Del Rey and the Avenue Church. And Michaela is one of those leaders. She also uh, is uh, uh, sings on Trinity's worship team. And uh, Michaela, we're going to start with you. Um, if you don't mind just kind of introducing yourself and you can, you can share a little bit about kind of what you do around the capital C church, because Absolutely. I know not just one church <laughs> and then a little bit about your journey. And then Sam will hear from you. Definitely. Definitely. Well, first off, I'm super excited to be here and, and I'm ex super excited to be in an environment talking about, uh, Jesus and mental health. Mm -hmm. Because for me, um, my journey started, uh, um, as a singer songwriter. And then I started back in 2017, I started a self empowerment campaign called be you. And mm -hmm. a lot of what I touch on, um, is mental health. I've traveled across the country speaking at middle high schools, and now I've started doing a, t a college campaign. Oh. Um, so mental health is something that I'm very familiar talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but talking about it, um, very, very blatantly with the, the, God element added into it to mm. me is something that I'm very, very passionate about and something mm. that I think is so, so important. And it's something that's missing, um, in a lot of our conversations about mental health okay. uh, nowadays. I am the worship leader for Trinity. I'm kind of the right hand, um, in all things worship. Awesome. Uh, I also love, absolutely love serving, uh, for our youth, uh, mm -hmm. with the kingdom students. And, uh, and I really have found a home over almost the past year at Trinity and and it's amazing how God placed me there in the midst of all of this COVID stuff, um, mm. really praying on feeling as though I wasn't really in the place. I had outgrown the pot that I was growing in. Mm -hmm. I had outgrown um, the position that I had been put in. And now being able to move into a place where God God said, you know, I have something more in store for you and in wow. a place where you can, you can serve and you can really find your identity mm. uh, in me was something that was so crucial because I remember in the midst of, of my own suffering with mental health, feeling as though I had an identity that wasn't mine. It was mm. my identity as I wanted the world to see me or as I felt like um, I needed to fit in, as mm. I felt like people would love me and mm. how, as people would accept me. I, I grew up in a household where, you know, I believe that uh, abuse is cyclical. Mm. I believe that we carry... Um, things from our past and, and my parents did an amazing job, uh, in the midst of their own traumas and their own addictions. Uh, but I did suffer, uh, some child abuse as I grew up mm -hmm. and, um, I carried that with me. I carried this, just this, this, 
desire to feel loved in a way that I, I knew I wasn't getting, Mm. uh, growing up. And so I went into school and I was severely bullied. I Mm. was, I was, um, all through kindergarten, I was a small kid. So I was, you know, thrown around and I Mm. was, you know, I was friends quote unquote with the mean girls, but you know, I was being used and, Mm. and I, spent a lot of time in church when I was young, but I really, I knew God, but I didn't know of God. Mm-hmm. I, or I knew of God, but I didn't know God. I didn't have sure. a, a relationship with him like I needed to have. And, you know, I, I grew up in a church where I started altar serving when I was eight. I grew up in, in the Catholic church. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question that I constantly was asking myself because I felt like I was being asked was what are you doing to earn your way into mm. the kingdom of God? So mm. I grew up with this belief that God's love, like everybody else's love was very conditional. Sure. I didn't grow up understanding radical grace. I didn't mm. grow up understanding that, you know, I was forgiven before I asked for it. Mm. And so that left this, this burden in my life. And so I, suffered from depression and anxiety. I had, I had trauma that I was carrying with me. And, um, when I was 14, I tried to take my life the first time and Mm. God saved me. Um, and I'll never forget walking around with just this burden. Like I had, you know, you're taught that the one sin that God doesn't Mm. forgive is that Mm. one. And, uh, I walked into, um, I was an altar server, and uh, I walked into our little, it's it's like an ultimate confession before you get confirmed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had told my priest and he told, he gave me, uh, John 10, 10 was the verse that he gave me. And mm-hmm. that, I have it tattooed on my ankle mm-hmm. um, over a, a self-harm scar uh, as just a reminder that, you know, God works all things for our good. Mm-hmm. And uh, from that moment on, I had this just fire in my soul mm-hmm. to serve God. Wow. And I knew that I needed to be in ministry, but I felt so caged and I didn't really understand um, that I could serve because mm-hmm. I was in a church where it was like become a nun. And right. so right. for about a month, I believed that I needed to become a nun and uh, realized that that much black is not, does not work for somebody (laughs) as bright as me. (laughs) So, um, so I, I ended up bringing the trauma that I had experienced, the depression that I was suffering from. I brought that into my, um, my early or my late teens and, uh, started choosing abusive relationships. So I went through a strain of, uh, emotionally, mentally, physically abusive relationships, uh, not realizing that I was choosing those things because that's what my identity was mm-hmm. in. My identity wasn't in, um, Christ's idea of who I was. Mm-hmm. I was a self harmer. I, uh, I was a, I had an eating disorder for 10 years mm-hmm. and, um, I, I really just did not believe that I was, I was what God wanted to use. And when I, when I was 19, I got diagnosed with something called fibromyalgia and fibromyalgia Mm. is a nerve disease. It's an autoimmune disease. And, um, it was because of me bottling all of my issues Mm. up for so long. So it was a result of my, my mental health. And it was a result of the trauma that I, I put on the show that I was perfectly fine Mm. and I let everybody else deal with their issues and I helped everybody through their issues, but I didn't want to look weak. Mm. And, um, So I was in a wheelchair and I was angry at God because I was trying to serve him. I was singing in a Catholic church. Mm -hmm. I, I believed I was listening to worship music and, and I, I was, I was in it, but then I was like, why would God do this to me? And, uh, very quickly after that, uh, my mindset, my mind, mindset changed. And I heard a sermon that basically told me that we were not, we were not spared from suffering, Mm -hmm. but it was all for God's glory. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to say, okay, I need to let go and I need to let God and I need to let God do his work. And I don't know what he's doing this for, but this has to be for him. Mm -hmm. And when I turned it over to him, I moved from a wheelchair to, uh, using a cane and I went from using a cane to going off the medications that they had me on and running and working out Mm -hmm. and, and really just shifting that mindset from what is God doing? Why is God doing this to me to what is God doing in my life? What is he trying to teach me and what is he trying to teach through me? Mm -hmm. 
changed everything. Mm. So I started uh, based on that. I had a, an epiphany in 2017 where um, I had God come to me and tell me that I needed to be working in ministry and I needed to be doing what I was doing for him mm -hmm. and decided to start very quickly after that. As I, I had taken a, a hiatus from music, from everything, I started a self-empowerment campaign and decided to use what I had learned through my experience to go into schools and help these kids realize that they weren't alone, mm -hmm. that they were validated, that the things that they were going through were real. But mm -hmm. when we shift our mindset mm -hmm. and when we realize that what we're going through can be used to help somebody else mm -hmm. and, and can, can be used in, in a positive way for God's glory, um, it, it's something that we don't hear a mm -hmm. lot. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very, Oh, woe is me. I don't know why I'm going through this. What did I do? The world is unfair sure. kind of mindset. Sure. And, uh, it's a, we live through other people's highlight reels. We live through the social media apps where everybody acts like everybody's okay. And we don't realize that the person next to you is suffering from something. The person next to you is, it has their own battles, has their own cross that they have to bear. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, I really decided that that was my mission was not only to, to work for the glory of God, but to also comfort and be near to the brokenhearted, which is what Christ tells us to do. He's near to the broken hardest and, and hard hearted. And he's, uh, he's with those who are, he's strong when we are weak. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was something that, you know, it took a long time for God to teach me, but I, I want people to understand that there are very physical, very real, very, um, tangible effects aside from from the other issues that mental illness has but if we if we bottle it up for too long there's mm -hmm. so many things that can go wrong and there's so many things i i wish i would have known mm. that i would end up with you know in a wheelchair sure. and all of these other things but um I know now that it's the best blessing in my life because I'm right. able to say, don't let it get so bad it's right. not it's not worth it yeah so so now I'm here and God has placed me here. He's placed me in, um, in Lancaster through, uh, mm. through the Ave and through Trinity right. and so studying ministry leadership and, and really shifting my gears into a place where God be, can be glorified everywhere. Wow. So. Oh. <laughs> wow. I mean, uh, we've had some intros to this show before, but I mean, <laughs> wow, that intro was amazing. Thank Just you. kind of, I was on the wow repeat, like, wow, wow. <laughs> um, and you know, wow like one. that, yeah, right. I mean that your story is just such a, um, a beautiful illustration of, you know, how God brings, um, beauty, uh, from ashes. Yes. And, uh, what's really cool is, is just to hear the power of how, when he began to shift your mind, things started to, to follow mm -hmm. along suit there. Um, and that's just Thank a you. powerful testimony. And Thank I love you. how you're so generous mm -hmm. with your healing and your freedom. Thank you. It's, it's a lifelong journey. And I think that it's something that people think that it's a one-stop shop and mm -hmm. we spend, you know, oh, we go through one class or we work through one small group or, and, and we hear one sermon or one sermon series and we've mm -hmm. worked through it. And it's kind of one of those things where you spend your whole life undoing the things mm -hmm. that the world has taught you to do. Mm -hmm. And so I like to say it's not a journey to find who we are. It's a journey to, to, uh, to find who we were before the world got a hold of us. So mm -hmm. we, we kind of take this journey to, to go back to who we, who we truly are. Mm -hmm. And it's a lifelong one. And, um, and when we address mental health, um, you know, it has to be real and it has to be honest. And if it's not, if it's not honest and it's not, uh, vulnerable, mm -hmm. it's not fair because mm -hmm. we're doing a disservice to what God has done in our lives. We're mm -hmm. not, when, when we, when we choose to hold things back, um, we don't know what somebody else could have gone through that could be the same, sure. that we could be keeping that from them. We can be keeping God's glory from them. Sure. So sure. I think it's important that we, that we find a way, you know, once we work through what we're going through to just be able to be vulnerable and put those walls down. So good. So good. And so, um, you know, what we're going to hear as we, as we get into a little bit of kind of like, what are we seeing out there? Um, and what would you like to say to both youth and parents? You're, you know, this is, this is coming from a place of that's, that's not, um, just theoretical. These are, 
you know, Michaela, you're sharing lived experiences and the fact that, you know, you mentioned uh, tour and campaign and uh, I just love the experience that you're, that you're bringing to this. And so thank you for that. And so um, you may or may not know Sam Powers. Uh, you may or may not know how he got here, uh, but he does serve as uh, the youth pastor of Kingdom Students, which again is the, our combined effort with Trinity. And uh, yeah, so Sam, tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got here. Oh. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, Sam, I'm the, the youth pastor at the Avenue in Trinity, getting to work with Kingdom Students. We got a, a whole team. Michaela's obviously on it, and that's been awesome. Uh, you know, I, I, I love getting to serve in student ministry. Um, it was a huge part of my life growing up. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's the way that uh, I came to faith was started in, in seventh grade. My mm. buddy was like, hey, you got to come out on Wednesday night. There's pizza and girls and we hang out. I'm like, Boom. hey, done. Fun. let's do that. Science, <laughs> Sounds like a good Sign time. Up. Yep. I went there and I got Jesus and it changed everything. Uh-huh. So, um, no, my youth pastor may preach the gospel to me and, and uh, seventh grade in a way that I understood it, mm. um, put my faith in Christ. And then that same youth pastor, like helped, helped disciple me, um, through middle school. And that went on through high school, um, grew up in Merritt Island. And mm. then I, I ended up going to college at PBA. Um, go sailfish. That's right. Go sailfish. <laughs> Nothing more intimidating than that's a sailfish. Right. We're going to get you. We're gonna <laughs> that's right. Watch out. It is better than an owl though. Yeah. I can't, yeah. well. <laughs> I don't know about this FAU. Uh, any, anyways, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I went to, I went to PBA, uh, wrestled with study and ministry cause I didn't really want to, it scared me. Nobody in my family had done it before. Mm-hmm. Um, so God sort of wrestled me into, into saying yes to that. Um, graduated from there, got married like five seconds after I graduated. <laughs> Clara. <laughs> That's right. Shout out. Shout out to Clara. Um, so yeah, we got married, you know, just a little bit over five years ago now I started working. Uh, in student ministry as the assistant youth pastor at Spanish River. And, um, man, that was awesome. Like, just getting to learn how to be married, learn how to be in ministry. Um, spent, you know, three years there. And then, you know, God sort of put this idea of church planting, actually, randomly <laughs> in my mind. And I, what? that's what happens if you hang out at Spanish River. Yeah, you're yeah. like, it's like the church planting. <laughs> that's mecca. right. That's right. Oh, you catch um, it. You catch that right. bug. So I was, I was like, man, I think I want to learn more about church planting. And the executive pastor there was like, oh, you should go hang out with Casey. Uh, and then that turned into this. He's so, still he's still <laughs> learning about church I'm planting. Still hanging out with Casey, learning about church planting. It's <laughs> awesome. Planting ministry, planting student ministries. Um, so yeah, I ended up coming up here and uh, really, honestly, like getting to plant the student ministry mm-hmm. with our team. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been a it's been a ton of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can remember being in, in high school and being like, man, my, my student pastor gets to like throw dodgeballs at me <laughs> and like right. we go grab coffee and like he tells me how to follow Jesus. Like I want to do that. Yeah. That sounds yes. awesome. Yeah. So we're doing it. And, and it's and it is as awesome as I thought it would be. Uh, it's hard, but man, it's a ton of fun. And, and just to touch on mental health, like it, it is like one of the biggest things I think students are struggling with right now. Mm. Um, so I feel like we have a responsibility as the church, not just to, you know, wave a banner for a few weeks, mm-hmm. but to really like talk about it, speak into it and see mm-hmm. how, how does Jesus, like, what does Jesus say and how does he transform the way that we handle mental health as opposed to somebody, um, who doesn't know Jesus cause mm-hmm. Jesus changes everything. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm excited to, to jump in. Love it. Love it. And, and one of the things that I love is, um, and this is just, it seems to be pretty true that um, you disciple oftentimes the way that you were discipled. Dodgeballs. You know? yeah, right. <laughs> Dodgeball, pizza, and caffeine. Yes. Um, but just that idea of like gospel first, but then gospel always in relationship. Mm. And, um, you know, the idea that maybe, maybe you met Jesus in a crowd but you learn to follow him in that slow pace of like one-on-one or like mm-hmm. smaller, smaller mm-hmm. environments. And um, as a parent of a child who's receiving that now, it is such a gift um, to see uh, my son uh, be able to receive like uh, uh, the person of Jesus through you in that pace that makes sense to him. So That's such awesome. a blessing, such a blessing. And so um, 
really, uh, really honored to have these two uh, people with us today. And, and, and so we're, we're going to go ahead and, get, and hop right in um, to topic at hand, which is um, mental health and, uh, and our youth. So the first question is, what are you guys seeing today? Like, what's the landscape out there? Michaela, I'm going to throw it your way. And yeah. then Sam, you can um, flesh out uh, that as well. But uh, what's going on with the youth right now? Well, not to, not to throw like stats in, in anybody's face. You know, we know the the statistics for most people know the statistics for suicide are 123 to 129 a day and and you know we talk about uh the top mental health issues which are thrown around a lot is you know depression anxiety the top five in college um and and they're starting to get younger depression anxiety suicide eating disorders and addiction but what most people don't realize is uh 50 of mental health issues develop by the age of 14 mm. um and 75 percent develop by the age of 24 and as of 2019 the average age for onset of panic disorder is 22 oh. so we're seeing and it's getting it's getting younger because there is this the world is so digitized now this um this need for human interaction and connection is especially right now with COVID is being lost. Um, mm. The uncertainties of the world. I mean, I know at the beginning of COVID when we were in quarantine, it was like abuse rates and suicides were going up something like 300%. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a really scary world for our youth because a lot of the things that were promised for them to them that they that they knew of the world that they're going to be growing into that they're going into as adults these career paths that they mm -hmm. thought that they had you know that they wanted to have a lot of these things are very um very touch and go now because mm -hmm. we don't know what the world's going to be this mm -hmm. is something we've never dealt with before but a lot of it for me that i'm seeing is there's this constant comparison to what we're seeing online mm -hmm. um it's i saw this girl on tiktok and she's so skinny or it's i uh saw this girl on tiktok and her life is so perfect or mm -hmm. i've seen these people and i want to look like that and mm -hmm. and we're taking um very um very, very drastic shortcuts of, you know, I want to get there and I want to get there now. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, uh, this, this constant comparison society. And we're living in this world where we're comparing our behind the scenes to other people's highlight reel. Mm. And I think that it's something that's very common with adults as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's happening more and more with the kids because I mean, some of the, the kids in, in our youth and some of the kids that I talk to, they're like, I've turned off finding out how long, you know, you know, your phone now, your iPhones tell you how long right. you're on yeah. them. Yeah, bad news. And they're like, I don't want to know. So yeah. I turned it off. And uh, it's scary sort of with them because that, they'd, like, rather, <laughs> they'd rather they'd rather be um, oblivious to the addiction. Mm. And it's, you know, it's the, the sense of imagination is very lost mm. and the sense of I'm going to have a conversation where I have to be. You know, you have those conversations where you break up with somebody in person or where you have mm. to have like a conversation that you don't want to have and it's uncomfortable in person. Right. They don't do that anymore. We, right. we text the conversation. So yeah. we don't know how to talk to people. Wow. We're not taught how to have mm -hmm. a con So we can't make friends mm -hmm. unless it's digitally. And, and so that leaves this just hole in our hearts that is just not full because we don't have just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. We don't mm -hmm. understand how to, we don't understand the biggest thing that I noticed when I was going into schools that mm -hmm. frustrated the Jesus out of me <laughs> and um, <laughs> literally, and I was like, Lord, please. It was eye contact. Mm. How often have you had a conversation with somebody? It happens with youth, but it even happens with adults now mm -hmm. where they, they can't look you in the eye for more than two or three seconds because mm -hmm. we don't know how to do that. Right. So it's, it's scary. It's yeah. really, really scary. And, and with COVID the way that it is now, um, it, it's only getting worse because it's this uncertainty that people are living with. And they, a lot of people have either this lukewarm or this lack of faith. Mm -hmm. So they don't have anything to put trust in. Mm -hmm. So now they're desperate trying to find things or reach out to things. Wow. So, so you are seeing, um, firsthand sort of some of the effects of this, 
um, radical increase in our technology from, you know, what's going on with like TikTok to Instagram to um, just like basically like even our, our phones. Yeah. Um, so, so is it fair to say that as that has increased, so too has some of these issues that we're dealing with? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that people are using, thank God, now we're getting into a place where people are using these platforms to be vulnerable and they're using mm. these platforms mm. to spread, you know, a lot of a lot of what I put out there is is very vulnerable and honest and mm -hmm. I see a lot of creators doing the same things okay. but the problem is if you're not looking for it, mm -hmm. it you know most of the time it's not going to find you mm -hmm. so we have the resources where you've got mental health professionals you've got people who are talking openly about what they've suffered from or what mm -hmm. they've been through or even just talking about how amazing God is mm -hmm. but we have to be seeking those things in order mm. to find them. Mm. And when we're not, it seems like what you're saying is that this, this social media, it can really feed that um, comparison sort of idle, and yes. which is just going to lead to destruction, despair. And then we're having an issue with this worth and value. I mean, it's, it's this over-sexualized, I have to do these things or dress this way, or I have to be, you know, in shorts that are far too short and mm -hmm. crop tops and all these things mm -hmm. in order to be liked or to feel like I'm pretty or I have to and and that's where I I remember battling those mm. thoughts and being mm. like oh my god everybody's butts on Instagram and mm -hmm. I don't want to do that but mm -hmm. that's how people get likes and I have to you know understand that that's not who, at, at all who I am but it's when you're at a younger age you're so much more susceptible yeah. to like well everybody else is doing it sure so the peer pressure is, is really really bad and so we're not really understanding where I where our identity is in mm. Christ and mm -hmm. where when we have identity in Christ we have to sacrifice certain things like that mm -hmm. and we understand our value so much more mm -hmm. so the value that especially young women are seeing in themselves mm -hmm. is is plummeting it's this desperation for love and it's this desperation to be loved and mm -hmm. it's i remember you know i can say because i remember being there mm -hmm. um and so really putting their value in what they're seeing and trying to to emulate it and and it's not it, it's it saddens me it breaks my heart mm -hmm. the more that i see it mm -hmm. so um and we're going to get to hopefully some uh, solutions here and mm -hmm. to not that they're quick, but um, because you know, as our, our last episode, John O'Brien was on, and, and I thought he said a really insightful thing definitions of like problems and issues um, are, are like signposts to solutions. So, as we're hearing, and hopefully, listener, as you're hearing the landscape and what's happening out here, you're starting to hear there's um, there's some space for us to do some work in, in identity and in value because those are those are part of the problems that the platform of social media is is exasperating in like a not a good way. And so this is really helpful to first talk about the problem before we get to solution. But already my mind is starting to think about like solution oriented things because this is not just going to take a community around around our youth. It's going to take a community that's strategically like pouring into spaces that that uh, our youth are in need of and so Sam throw it your way what are your eye you know what are you seeing out there kind of what's what's coming across your perspective as far as like mental health and the youth yeah no I mean a lot of the same things mm -hmm. um, obviously but you know you talk about statistics and, and we just finished we did this series in mental health with our high school students and one of the statistics that I remember from from like getting ready for that mm -hmm. those talks and things is is that um of of 13 to 18 year olds 49 percent struggle with some sort of a mental health mm -hmm. issue 49 mm -hmm. percent wow and, and then of that 49 percent 22 percent of those would would be like severe impairment is what the the national wow. institute of mental health calls it like the, that's huge numbers yeah. yeah and so you know i think what's helpful to remember is that like <laughs> it's always been hard to be a teenager sure like always right you know and, and that's something that maybe we're quick to quicker to forget even when as, i was a teenager <laughs> way back then <laughs> right but that's what i'm saying 1980 like, something like, or other like nobody thinks like oh let me think back to when i was thriving like yeah. mentally physically emotionally right spiritually like out there yeah, that's when i was 13 that's when i had life together yeah, right, no, right, like, right right life is a mess when you're 13 sure regardless and then some of the things that we're talking about just fuel that fire mm. But as adults, sometimes, and I, and I think this is part of the problem, is we have a hard time remembering, uh, like, like what it's like to be mm. fifteen, mm. what life is like, and, mm -hmm. and 
and you're in this weird in between of like you're not a little kid you're you're not really an adult yet yeah. you're you're trying to figure life out and then so you throw some fuel on this yeah. thing that's already a huge fire and then you know you add in that, that adults are like oh what you got a test tomorrow uh you know suck it up i'm sorry that's you know right sounds tough right well like that's their whole world it yeah. is tough like yeah. if your whole world came down and yeah. somebody was like ah oh, well i got a bigger problem like right. yeah that's gonna that's gonna crush you so um i was just you know thinking about and i made a list here of five or six things that you know like contribute to to some of that that's already going on Mm -hmm. and Michaela you touched on some of these I think just developmentally you know you're in this in between already when and during the teenage years like one of the things that's most important to you and you touched on this is like peer-based approval like Mm -hmm. what what do my friends think about me that's Mm -hmm. something that a lot of us never grow out of and Mm -hmm. continue to struggle with but but when you're developing as a human and that's like your number one thing Mm. um you know even even when I went to high school like not everybody had iPhones. Mm-hmm. So, so I went, I interacted with my peers for seven hours, eight hours, mm-hmm. and then I went home and I could turn off and I could reset and I could go back to war the next day. Yeah. Right. You know, right. And, and fast forward, not that long. That's, it's a 24, seven, 365 battle yeah. that you never unplug. Right. Like you, you're always fighting that mm. battle of peer based approval. It, mm-hmm. It's probably worse when you go home right. and everybody's, everybody's online. Sure. So, right. you know, some of these things, and then you add in, obviously 2020 and you know Mm -hmm. extra screen time isolation your events are getting canceled you know it just it's fueling the fire so i think we gotta remember it's always been hard to be a teenager Mm. and it's way harder right now for these kids and and i think the first step in any sort of solution is like recognizing that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Mm. it's tough so um, did, were there other factors that you wanted to hit on that list? Yeah, just, just screens, the, the pandemic, the isolation, how you, know, you take that and then put a kid on, online for nine hours a day. Right. And, you know, so. Well, I, I think that's, that's really insightful. Uh, and so, I mean, what, what you're hearing, hopefully, is what I'm hearing is that it's always been difficult to move through your adolescent journey and your teenage years. Um, but now there are actual, like, um, catalysts to making it way more difficult than it than it used to be i mean i mean things are working against in a in a more aggressive fashion right now um are are growing healthy kids uh than than they were you know 20 years ago even even probably 10 years ago um and so uh, I, so here here's what i want to do i want to um i want to shift gears into two things um and so w- First, I want to I want to ask you guys, what is it now that you would want to say as we've kind of defined and looked at some of the problem? Which, listen, we could we could be here weeks just <laughs> continuing to look at the problem in the landscape, and so this is like a taste of it. But now now we have a, at least a working idea of what's going on out there and, and why, uh, to some degree. What would you want to say um, to our youth? We're going to camp out there for a minute, and then we'll finish by saying what's what's the word to the parents and those who are influencing the next generation? So to the youth that are listening um, or have parents that are listening or have people who are like loving on them listening, if you were to speak to the youth right now, Mikhail, I'm going back to you. All right. Go, you know, open mic oh, to the Oh, man. Um, honestly, for me, when I was that age and I was suffering, uh, the biggest thing that I battled with was feeling like I didn't have enough faith. Like mm-hmm. I wasn't... Um, like I wasn't a good Christian because Mm. I suffered. And I think Mm. that there's this stigma around that, um, that, you know, we are not promised a life devoid of suffering. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you know, we go into battle when we bring darkness to light and when Mm -hmm. we work for, Mm -hmm. for God's good. And and when we work for God's glory, um, the biggest thing is, you know, first off, like your, your feelings are valid. Mm -hmm. Um, your sufferings and your emotions and your point of view, it's valid. Mm -hmm. And if somebody hasn't told you that, Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that is so important because I feel like we brush off those emotions so easy. Um, but also in the face of, of, of suffering and of trial, you know, that we, we are 
constantly reminded that God is working things for his good, even when we don't see it. And mm-hmm. even when we don't understand, it's not for us to understand. Even mm-hmm. when I don't see it, mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I, I did this. We did, um, we did see a victory on Sunday and I just felt like the spirit come over. And I was just like, even when, you know, you, you do you take what the enemy uh, meant for evil and you turn it for good. I'm like, even when we don't see it, even when we don't understand, even when we're angry at God, mm-hmm. even when we're running away from God, even when we, you know, we don't find faith. You know, it's not always about praising God. It's about leaning into him. And how much better is it knowing that you don't have to walk alone? Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of my favorite points in, um, in, uh, scripture is uh, when we talk about even, um, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil for thou art with me. Um, the, the word through essentially means that there is an end Mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for me, that's such a promise is, 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 you know, there, there is an end at mm-hmm. some point mm-hmm. and we will get to the other side, but the two things that are so important is, is conversation with God and bringing your real emotions. I remember growing up feeling like I had to be on my best suit and tie formal dress behavior when mm-hmm. I prayed mm-hmm. and I couldn't just tell God how angry and mad and confused and, and depressed I was, mm-hmm. um, and, and now I scream and cry in prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, but God wants our real emotions. Mm-hmm. Jesus wants our real emotions. Mm-hmm. And he wants us to finish our prayers by saying, you know, but I trust you. Mm-hmm. It's not fair. It, it's, it feels like the world is crashing down, but I trust you. Mm-hmm. And in that, you know, God is with, is with us. Mm-hmm. And, and also, I mean, community. You know, we, we are lucky to have, you know, small c, that, you know, a, a community, a church community that, that loves and supports us mm-hmm. and, and wants to see God work. Don't be like me. I'm learning now how to put walls down and mm-hmm. how to be vulnerable and how to not hold the cards. Mm-hmm. And, and we have to stop trying to be so strong mm-hmm. all the time and mm-hmm. pretend like we have it all together. You're in a community where they're going to lift you up when you are at your lowest. And the only way to get through those low times and through those valleys is by being honest with yourself first Mm -hmm. and being honest with others and let others walk with you Mm -hmm. through it. Mm -hmm. I I feel like we try to do so many things on our own when we really don't have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would, that would be it. (laughs) That's great. Uh, and, and in that, um, love that I'm hearing permission and possibility. Like I'm hearing permission to, to like, do you be where you are? Like you don't have to come and perform for us. And then possibility that like there's, there's hope in the midst of your reality. Mm-hmm. That's good news for, I don't, it doesn't matter whether you're 13, 46, mm-hmm. however old you all are. Like it, that is good news for those who struggle for sure. Um, Sam, so open mic, you know, take a few moments to just kind of speak out there to um, students who, who may be struggling. Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things we, we talk about a lot is, is our, our faith, like Jesus. Jesus, doesn't, Jesus isn't like a thing that we set over here and we, we pray our prayers, we go to church, we get to go to heaven when we die, and then I go and try to live as best I can out mm-hmm. in the world, mm-hmm. knowing that that's true. But like, like Jesus transforms, the gospel changes every part of what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, what we're hearing and what we're seeing with the youth is like, man, there's, you know, we talk about social media. We, we talked about this the other day. Like, mm-hmm. that's the cry. Like, somebody see me. Somebody mm-hmm. notice me. Somebody mm-hmm. like me. Follow mm-hmm. me. Like, I want to be seen. Mm-hmm. And so the way the gospel informs that is that God sees you. Mm. Like, j- God sees you. Mm-hmm. you. You referenced, Michaela, Psalm 34. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. So... So just to know, like, man, it seems like there's a lot of students out there who, who are longing to be seen, who mm-hmm. are longing to, to be, like, validated, to use your word. Like, and, and the place we have to start is that God sees you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He sees you. Um, and so, you know, that, that's where I would start. Because if we understand that God is sovereign, uh, that he's totally in control, he's totally all-knowing, all-powerful, he, he knows you better than you even know yourself. Um, that, that changes your, that actually changes what you're going through. That changes what you're feeling because all of a sudden, if you have a God who sees you and who knows you, 
well then now now you're not alone. Mm-hmm. God is God is with you. And even if you're not getting externally the things that you want and the things that you should have from mm-hmm. some from certain places and your family and certain things, you can actually be okay. You can be 15 and you can actually be okay because you've got a sovereign savior who sees you. And so if other people don't see you, mm-hmm. That's sad, and we see you, and we, we want to help you, but we're mm-hmm. not your Savior. God sees you. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that, that's where we've got to start. And then second, I would tell you, like, God God loves you. God loves you like crazy. Um, in, in Christ, the Bible said God God lavishes his love on us in, in mm-hmm. 1 John. Mm-hmm. And I remember that's a word that I struggle with. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, like lavish your love. Yeah. I don't, like, hear, I don't hear Cole dropping that much as my, <laughs> as my 15-year-old. <laughs> Right. But like the idea that, that, that God lavishes his love on us, I'm like, I don't feel that sometimes. I feel like I know God like has to love me yeah. contractually. Right. The right. Gospel, right. But he like, signed up for it. He's not super <laughs> happy with me right now. Like, yeah. I don't know that he likes me right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think the flaw in that thinking is, is that, that, okay, well, God's love for me must be based on how I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Mm. And none of us are doing super well. Or if, feeling. If we're awesome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Or God loves me how I'm feeling mm-hmm. yeah. based on how I'm feeling. Well, not crushing that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But the, the again, the beauty of the gospel is that God's love for me is not dependent on how I'm doing or how I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about like it's the imputed righteousness of Christ, which, which is just meaning like it's Christ's life, it's Christ's righteousness credited to me mm-hmm. that I didn't earn. Mm-hmm. So God's God's love for me is the same of his love for Jesus, which mm. is lavished. Right. Right. I haven't earned lavished love. I haven't earned any love. Right. But when when Christ's when Jesus' life is put on me, his righteousness, man, talk about a, a love that can't be taken away. Yeah. Talk about a love that again, if you're not getting it from other places, which we hope you are, mm-hmm. students, and, and like you should, and that's right, but it's a, it's a broken world, and sometimes we don't mm-hmm. give mm-hmm. love from the people that should love us. Right. But this is why the gospel changes everything, and not just a good mentor who likes you. Right. Yeah. Because those things come and go, but, but Jesus' love can't be taken away. Yeah. And so, so, so I would say God sees you, God loves you, and then, and then thirdly, God says, God says, come with me. He, he doesn't mm-hmm. just leave us where we are, but he, he calls us to more. Mm-hmm. And, and I, think, I think that's huge. Because I, I remember thinking like, okay, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Mm-hmm. Amen. Right. <laughs> you know, and like, yeah, that's, that's true. We, we get certain things, but God calls us to, to walk with him. And again, it's walking with Jesus, like following him, being a disciple of Jesus is, to me, it's so huge when I learn how to see every part of my life my mental health, my sports team, my siblings, the way I interact with my parents, what I do at church, how I act with my friends at church versus how I act with my friends at school. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus transforms all of those things as I learn to see them through the light of what Jesus has done for me. Mm. So I I think that's what I would say is that God sees you. He loves you. And he says, come with me. I've got more for you. Mm. I don't want you to stay here. Mm. I've got more for you. Mm -hmm. So that's a good word, Sam. Um, thanks for sharing that. And, and just as you were talking, I, I was reminded of how in the beginning of Exodus, um, the beginning of God freeing his people out of slavery that they were in in Egypt, um, wh- it, it, you see there at the beginning of that narrative that he, he like saw and knew. You know, and they were so they were seen and known in the midst of their slavery, mm-hmm. and that seems to be the beginning point of their freedom out. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I don't think we can under understate the power of seeing and knowing, especially when you have influence and authority mm-hmm. um, regarding uh, the youth. And so, that's going to transition us into kind of our final, our final um, area of discussion. Here is, um, you know, Michael, I'm coming back to you. Mm-hmm. Like a word to parents, you know, how, what, what is your encouragement to me yeah. um, and to, to the, those who influence the youth, whether they're parents, aunts, uncles, youth workers, teachers, whatever the case may be, like, like how can we participate in the healing process yeah. here? Well, well, first off, you know, one of the things that I, I would want to tell my parents as, as a teen and as an adult who suffered from mental illnesses is, is like parents, if your child is suffering, it, it doesn't mean you're a failure. Mm. It, it doesn't mean mm. that you did anything wrong. Um, 
you know, a, a lot of times I was angry at my parents for a really long time because, uh, you know, how, you know, they did this and, mm-hmm. and it's like, you know, we, we only are able to do the best that we can. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that's something that a lot of parents, you know, I remember my parents took it personally because I made it their fault for mm-hmm. a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. And I think I, I came across this quote, uh, not long ago and it says, uh, children are not problems. They have problems. Focus on helping your child, not fixing your child. I think, I think the biggest thing that we get caught up in, um, in, and parents get caught up in is, you know, that, that dismissiveness mm. of like, oh, it's not that big of a deal to them. It is. Mm-hmm. And, and like we talked about at the beginning, you know, that, oh, you know, try being an adult, you have that thought. And it's right. like, wait a second. Like they don't have any frame of reference other than <laughs> school is my life. Right. My grades are my life. And neither yeah. did you when you were 16. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And so, you know, sometimes all kids need is somebody to listen. And, and, um, sometimes it's not you. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's somebody mm-hmm. else. You you know, don't feel like your child needing professional help, needing a therapist mm. Mm. means that you're a failure as a parent. Right. Just to focus on helping your child get better. Don't take it personally. Right. And really just, if they come to you to vent about something, don't dismiss it. Like just, just, you know, we're taught to, to really speak life into it and, mm-hmm. and to thank them for sharing and thank them for being vulnerable and, and with mm-hmm. with anybody. And I think that we forget to do that a lot of times mm-hmm. is, you know, thank you for telling me that. I know that that must've been hard. I know that what you're going through must be difficult. And you know, how does that make you feel? kids don't get listened to a lot of times societally we don't listen we wait for the chance to speak again Mm. and and when we practice more active listening and more okay how do we how do we remedy the problem but also understanding that sometimes they just want to talk and they just want you to hear them they don't want you to offer a solution they just want Mm. somebody they want to let it out Mm -hmm. let Mm -hmm. be a sounding board Mm. and and just cheer them on Mm. let them trust you and let them confide in you and and you know they're at that age where a lot of times like i didn't want to confide in my parents but um the biggest thing is like once we get past that point of i failed as a parent because Mm. my child is depressed Mm. um i think that changes everything and really pointing them back to to god you know community can only do so much Mm -hmm. but uh, i know when we were on um, our mission trip uh something that sam had brought up that i thought was really 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 special was that you know we can only do so much if, and and we're not doing the right things if we're not ultimately pointing them back to mm-hmm. to Jesus and pointing them back to Scripture and pointing them back to um, that unfailing, unrelenting, just chases after you no matter how far you run, fully accepting, fully forgiving love mm-hmm. that we as humans are incapable mm-hmm. of providing. Mm-hmm. 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 So. Uh, first of all, kind of getting over yourself as a parent and not not thinking that your child's performance is about you and like, you know, becoming prideful if it's going well and become in falling into despair if it's not like like this is my fault. And so and then secondly, you know, obviously what, what I hear you saying is just like engaging listening, yeah. like that being such a an agent of even healing. Correct. I mean, like oh, yeah. that. Like, like sometimes that's enough. Oh yeah. If I'm hearing you correct. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it becomes uncomfortable. I know. I talk about things with my dad, um, going through you know resurgences of PTSD and trauma and all of these things that you know it it tr- goes with you through life. And um, I've had to have a conversation with my dad because he would very quickly change the subject. Mm. And I was like, Hey, listen, is mm. this uncomfortable for you? And he immediately was like, Yeah, to know that you were hurting and you were suffering. It, it makes me, it makes me so upset and mm-hmm. it saddens me so much. Don't, don't let that mm. turn you off or take that personally, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because sometimes, you know, that might be the only chance. You don't know if it's the only opportunity where a child feels vulnerable enough yeah. to say something. Right. Right. And what do you think, Michaela, about, um, the pursuit of parents? So let's say we want to be good listeners, but we don't feel like we're getting a ton from our, you know, whatever, 16-year-old. Mm-hmm. Um, speak, speak a little bit about what it looks like to pursue um, conversations with your child in a not super annoying way, but yeah. also in like a, a way that, you know, doesn't give up. 
Oh, absolutely. Oh my goodness. Um, I really think it's just about being patient. It's not about being too persistent. I think you have to feel out, Mm -hmm. you know, the energy of, Oh, this person doesn't want to talk about this. Oh, they might want to talk about this. If your child gets excited or your teenager gets excited about something, talk about that thing. If they're excited about some movie that you have no idea what it is, nor do you really care very much, let them talk about it. That's how you're going to get to the point where you start to build that. It's a trust building thing. So you have to let them build that trust with you. Oh, they want to talk about this thing. I really don't understand this. Oh, tell me like what about it interests you Mm -hmm. or, or feeding into their likes and dislikes. I think once you get to that point, then it's able to be more of a a conversation of, Mm -hmm. okay, now we can move into some other topics or, Mm -hmm. or not being persistent. You know, I know how much we want to talk about these things with our, our kids, but I think that it's important to just at least know that they're talking about it with somebody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be you, Mm -hmm. but you can get, you can find that balance of, of really being able to talk to them about, you know, let them gauge the conversation and then eventually it'll come out. Right. Right. And so, I mean, just picking up that vibe of like, it's still our responsibility to win our children at age 13, 14, 15. Like we have to, like, I, like we, I I need to continue to win the affection of my wife and pursue her, Mm -hmm. even though we've been married 25 years almost. Um, and you know, that that's true of my teenager as well as like, you know, from, from what I'm hearing you is like, you, you got to hang in there and it's your job to continue to win them and be vulnerable. I Mm. mean, realistically, like be real with what you've, you've dealt with. Mm. I mean, I think that that, that's super important too, of like, you know, there's this level of, of that I've learned, um, by going into schools where like you kick down that door of conversation, the moment that you say, Hey, I'm human and Mm -hmm. I've suffered and Mm -hmm. I've gone through this and you know, you're not alone immediately. It's okay okay, this is a safe space to share. It's yeah. not, I'm trying to keep this, I'm your parent and I'm perfect and I don't do anything wrong. Right. You know, the, the days of that are over. I yeah. think, I think we have to just break that stigma and mm. just say, listen, I'm human. And when I, you know, I I've gone through this and I've gone through that. And, and when we're more honest about those things, I think that that also helps them to be more vulnerable and feel like they can share. I feel like it almost becomes a wall builder if you're not. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's our love language right now. It, vulnerability, authenticity. And so if you don't, it's it's a, it's a way of like speaking a language that I think our children are going to hear. Absolutely. You're doing a disservice. Uh, the, this generation craves authenticity. Mm-hmm. It feeds off of just genuine authenticity and realness. Mm-hmm. And, and not only are you doing, like we had talked about earlier, are you doing a disservice to God and mm-hmm. showing God's glory, mm-hmm. but you know, you're doing a disservice to the next generation by trying to be on your best behavior. Right. 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 That's good. That's good. And, and, you know, and I do think even though I said sometimes listening is enough and I think there are situations when we're just called to listen, you know, I am reminded of the fact that we are their God given ordained parents. And when you make it your job to listen, we can also trust the spirit to meet us when it's time to speak. And, you know, we can, we can actually get resources that will help us to be prepared for those moments, especially in struggle. Sam, what do you got? I mean, speak, I'm, I am, you know, like one of the, one of your parents, you know? And so what what do you, what do you got for me? You know, like you got Cole. So what do I need to know? So I mean, as I as I listen to what we're talking about, like we're really saying, be be like Jesus, mm-hmm. <laughs> like mm-hmm. like get that, get on their level, mm-hmm. like Christ come, leaves heaven, gets on our level, mm-hmm. like did didn't have to do that, like chose out of the love that he had for his children to get down on their level by you know listening, engaging in these different things. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I, I think that's huge, and the, and then just I I love the talking about like the the faithfulness of Jesus's ministry with the disciples, Mm -hmm. like years walking Mm -hmm. with the, walking with these dudes. And Mm -hmm. so like, you know, we talk about these, you know, I think like moments matter, you know, moments mattered in, in Mm -hmm. in the gospel. It mattered to Jesus, but like faithfulness sort of marked his ministry. I think Mm -hmm. long, steady faithfulness Mm -hmm. with the few. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about parents, like I, I think your long, steady faithfulness in listening to your child, like, pointing them to Jesus when they want to hear it. And when they don't Mm -hmm. like makes a far greater impact than like, than the pressure of the moment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Cause it's like, Oh man, all right, I got to sit down. Tell me your deepest, darkest secrets. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. that didn't go well. Right. 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 (laughs) Yeah. But like, so so just to take the pressure off a little bit, like it's not as much maybe about the moment as it is faithfully, like walking with them through the ups and downs, listening, 
and pointing them to Jesus. Um, just sort of what I'm, I'm thinking about as I, as I listen. But, um, you know, one of the questions I would ask as ending sort of talking about parents is, is what do you, what do you want most for your student mm. as it pertains to, to mental health? Mm-hmm. Because I can, I don't have, I don't have kids, but I can understand the desire for your child to never struggle with mental health. Mm-hmm. I get that. Like, why, who, why would you want that? Mm-hmm. And I, I can also understand how, how your thought would be, okay, what I want most is how can I get them out of this struggle as soon as possible? I don't want my child to be anxious. Mm-hmm. I don't want my child to be depressed. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. Nobody wants that. But I, I think we need to be really careful about what we want because you look throughout scripture and, and, and God uses struggle. Mm. God uses mm-hmm. struggle. Mm-hmm. And, and I think what we're called to is is like to to point our students whether i'm the youth pastor or you're the dad is to point these kids to jesus Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and we need to be open to the fact that maybe god has given this struggle as as a way for your student to learn how to depend on jesus Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that's what we want we want to make christ dependent disciples right who who like are, are struggling through it and so maybe you know running into anxiety and how do i do this well, man, what is, what is, how does Jesus transform that? Mm-hmm. Like, instead of like, get it off, get it off, get it off. Mm-hmm. How does Jesus change this? Yeah. Because maybe God has, has sovereignly ordained that to, to, to bring your child to him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think that's like, I think that's far more important. I think that's the best thing we could do as, as like, as a student pastor, as student leaders, or as, you know, youth, youth ministry leaders is to point these kids to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I think it's it's good motives to. I mean, I get that struggle off. I don't. I don't want that. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, but but I think way more than that, it's growing a dependency. You know, you hear people say like, uh, you know, the best thing you can give your kids is a healthy marriage. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, sure, that that's good. Mm-hmm. I think the best thing you can give your your kid is like showing them how Jesus transforms everything. Mm. Like like making making them dependent on Jesus. So can I because the, you keep going. Go ahead. No. Well I just I mean there's a there's a lot of people whose parents had a good marriage hmm. who never fell in love with Jesus. Mm. Like is that what we want as the mm-hmm. church? Right. Just like that's a good thing. You should have a good marriage. That's a right. good thing to pursue but but right. I, but like one day I want my kids to be dependent on Jesus more than they can say, Yeah, I had a good home growing up. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think I think our perspective mm. has to shift in there that that our our kids would see all of life as like how does how does Jesus transform this and how can I walk with him through it mm-hmm. like that's huge and mental health is is in there so I think that's a a very clarifying question on what do you want mm-hmm. for your kids the absence of pain mm-hmm. or the ability to depend on Jesus no matter what mm-hmm. so and this may lead us into a whole nother episode but I need to, I want to ask this question because I think it's it's fair to the listening listening audience um, both of you have said um, the ability to point your kids to Jesus mm-hmm. okay so that means something to some of us who are listening and it, and it, and that's like uh what are you talking about mm-hmm. to others can you give me like a little bit of help if i'm a parent what does that look like you know i, I hear i hear those words but like how do i be, even begin to do that mm-hmm. so I, I i actually wrote down a couple parent resources and i and i think these are like super practical places to go Great. Like right now Let's hear to, to help do that. So there's this website called uh, Axis, and they put out these parent guides, and, and they're, you know, mm. eight, ten pages or whatever, mm-hmm. and they break down, okay, what, you know, here's what your teen is seeing and experiencing on social media or with depression or pornography or whatever. They've got, mm-hmm. like, a, a bunch of these topics, and they, they unpack them in a way that, like, hey, here's what's happening. Mm-hmm. Here's what the gospel says about it. Mm-hmm. Here's ways you can engage. Here's places you can learn more. Mm-hmm. I think just... You know, if, if a parent comes to me and says, hey, I, you know, I found out my student's struggling with it. That's like one of the first places I go. Okay. It's like, OK, I'm going to send you this this thing. Great. It costs like three dollars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm going to mm-hmm. email it to you. And that's the first place I would go. Mm-hmm. Here's how you can understand it. And here's how you can relate it to the gospel. And then mm-hmm. second, there's a um, I don't know if it, I guess it's a website, but it's something I follow on, on Instagram. It's called Feed Youth Ministry. Mm-hmm. F.E.E.D. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's super good. Um, and it's it's kind of geared towards youth pastors. Um, but go there anyways. Like yeah. it, it just, it helps, it helps. Okay. You know, we talk about suicide or, or cutting or some of these crazy things. It's like, I don't even have a context for yeah, that right. as a parent. What do I do? Right. 
that's a place that helps us like understand what's happening mm. and then direct that conversation back to Jesus. Cause it's like, okay, mm. how do I take depression and make it about Jesus? Mm -hmm. Well, there's tools out there to go to. And then lastly, I would say, are you, are you as a parent seeing all of your life? Yeah. Like, are you being discipled? Right. Are you in community? Right. Like, are we asking our kids to do stuff that we, that we're not doing ourselves? Wow. Yeah. So, um, that's what I would say is, are you, are you doing it yourself? Not mm -hmm. perfectly, because mm -hmm. the answer is no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no right. one is. You're right. struggling yourself, but you're yeah. struggling towards yeah. Jesus. And then I think Access um, and Feed Youth Ministry are two super helpful tools to, to go do that like wow. today. Wow. That's a, that is fantastic handles on, on something that is um, just deeply needed. Um, in, in, in our youth and, and for our parents. And so, um, you know, we're, we're about out of time. I just want to say a, a super big thank you to you, Michaela, your authenticity, what you shared in your story. I know there's a ton uh, more that you could have shared and that you do share. Um, yeah. And so I know that uh, you're, you're really generous with your time and things like that. And so if you're out there and you're listening, um, and you heard something about from, from Michaela, her story, some of the things sh that she shared or Sam and some of the things that he's seeing and, you know, th even those, those gospel centered resources. Um, I'm just, I, I know them and I know they're very generous with like making themselves, uh, available absolutely uh, to help to help and so absolutely. hey uh just uh, a lot of love uh for both you guys thank you so much um as the the host of this show but um even more uh as as a parent of of somebody that uh, is being truly blessed um, by you guys and so that is our show um for uh today and uh, we are so glad that you joined us on good news for those who struggle and uh we'll see you next week love y'all